Hi and welcome back. In today's tutorial we will talk about segmentations. To be more precise, it will be about semantic segmentation. So, when we start to learn deep learning, our first experiments are tasks that are usually related to solving classification problems. So, for example, we need to determine a class label of the object in the image. So here we have a cat, we pass it into a neural network and we get an output label. So next we encounter problems such as object detection. The difference is that apart from the need to determine the class label, we also need to determine the position of the bounding box that implies where the object is. So we need to localize where this cat is in the image. And on the other hand, there are tasks when we need to be even more precise when processing images. Imagine that you have an image of yourself and you want to change the background of your photo. In this case, you uh, need a very precise edge contour detection that will segment and label all pixels that belong to your body. So the output image of the segmentation process should uh, label all the pixels that belong to the person as a unique label class. So to illustrate this a little better, we will have a look at an image here. So the goal of the segmentation is to create an image of the same size as the input image. So the image on the right. And the pixels of the new image should belong to one of the four groups. So it should belong to cat, grass, sky or trees. And when we perform a segmentation, there are two possibilities. Instance and semantic segmentation. For instance, a cat can be seen as an instance. If there are two cats, both cats should be represented with the pixels from the same class label. If we are interested in separating every single object instance, we are performing instance segmentation. So, we can look at an image here. So, as I said before, if we have two cats in the image and a dog, the semantic segmentation will segment all of the same labels. So, we have two cats here that are labeled as cat and one dog. But if we use instance segmentation, our two cats will be have labels uh, separated labels. So we have cat1 and we have cat2. And that we, because we have one dog, it will just remain dog here. And also, if we are not uh, interested in segmenting objects that are not instances, such as sky or grass, we are performing semantic segmentation. Hence, within a deep learning framework, our goal is to train a neural network for segmentation steps. This training should enable us to produce an output image of the same size as the input image, as I mentioned before. And yet, the pixels of the output image should represent class labels of objects that are detected in the input image. So, going back here, we have a yellow image here that represents the cat and the green image, green color here, color not image, represents the grass. So sky is blue and the trees are a purplish color here. So we have illustrated a semantic segmentation here. Fully convolutional neural networks that we have commonly used for classification can be used for semantic segmentation as well. Obviously, later we will discuss more advanced models for segmentation. But historically, we will start with the first paper that employed deep learning architectures in 2015. Commonly, a network starts with a series of convolutional layers, and then we have several fully connected layers at the end. However, in the end, instead of a classification output, for example a softmax layer, here we have an image of the same size as the input, as we can see in this, in this flow here. But the image size or feature maps, that is the number of pixels, will decrease as we propagate through the network. So we need to make some adjustments and modifications to the network so it outputs the same size image. So the first step here is to replace the fully connected layers with the convolutional layers. So these here were the fully connected layers and we replaced them with the convolutional layers down here. The second step would be replacing the last layer in such a way that it matches the size and the resolution of the input image. So we have an input of 640 times 480 and the output is an image of the same size. And the third step is that the network will be trained using the softmax cross-entropy loss function. It will be calculated in a pixel-wise manner between the predicted output of the network and the ground truth label. So here we are not just uh, comparing labels, we are comparing two images. So 
One way to convert fully connected layers is to use a one-by-one -one convolution, and this process is known as convolutionalization. If you need to refresh your knowledge, I will leave a link down in the description how you can do one-by-one -one convolutions. But moving on here, uh, we can see that we are now not doing a simple classification problem as before. We are not classifying if the, in the image is a dog or not. We are now classifying where the dog is in the image and we are segmenting its body in the image, as we can see in the output here. So, uh, in addition, this research work proposed to use different levels for the segmentation. In the image here, high-level features are used to obtain a heat map. However, to better predict, predict the edges or, and contours of the object, the low and intermediate level features are also used. So, if we recall, the, the first layers in the collusional network, the layers here, learn to recognize and detect edges. So, a combination of high coarse layers with low and fine layers obtains an improved segmentation accuracy. Now, let's talk about SegNet. So, this approach represents a further improvement in the segmentation-related networks. It uses the well-known autoencoder-decoder architectures to develop a neural network. And the first part of the network is a classical CNN that consists of convolutional net layers and max pooling layers. In addition, it also uses batch normalization layers as well as ReLU activation functions. And these layers are often used in deep learning. One novelty that can be observed in SegNet is the use of the upsampling layer, the upsampling layer plus convolution. It can be seen here in the right part in the decoder part. We also use convolutional filters and their parameters are trained using backpropagation. So, what's new here? The transpose convolution. So, we, can, we will see this in more detail of upsampling plus the convolution layer. And this, we can see this demonstrated in this GIF here. So, our goal is to increase the size of the feature map, let's say from this 3x3, the blue squares here, to a 5x5 output feature map. And uh, the process of a transpose convolution consists of the following steps. So, we have our 3x3 feature maps and we want to upsample it. So, we will add the white squares that you can see here around each of these blue squares and there uh, they have the value of 0. Then we will have a 3x3 convolutional filter kernel that we will use to produce our output. So, this filter is shown as a gray square that is going over this map and it is a 3x3 square. We can see that at uh, that particular point position it will generate the one output element, one pixel in the final map, the 5x5 map. And to better illustrate this concept, we will demonstrate an alternative illustration of the transpose convolution. So now assume that we want that we have this 2x2 feature map and we want to upsample it to a 4x4 feature map. So in simple words, the transpose convolution in this case will just scale the filter elements and place them in the output. This is illustrated using this 3x3 red square here. And that is the filter coefficients are multiplied with a single element depicted in red. And these values are stored in the output here. So next, as we move our filter to process the element colored in the blue, co blue here, uh, we will again multiply the filter coefficients with this value. Then we will store this, the results in the output feature map as shown in this 3 by 3 square, blue square here. Now, note two things here. First, the filter in the output image is defined with a stride of 2. So, we can see that it is going 2 pixels in the right. And uh, there is an overlapping column between the red and the blue squares here. So, this purple, purple region here. And these values will be summed and, and stored accordingly. And then, moving on, we will repeat this process over here and obtain the following output image. So, here we can see that we moved, uh, for example, we placed a yellow kernel and the uh, green kernel over here. And we obtained this 5x5 five five output image. So we essentially wanted to get a 4x4 four four, and to obtain it, we'll just trim these, uh, these pixels on the left here and on the top. top. And if, in addition, you can notice here that the final output image has a pixel value that is obtained by four summations of the scaled, uh, scaled filter coefficients. 
it is a pixel that is an intersection of all four squares so we can see it here in the middle and then uh, this is how we essentially do an upsampling of a upsampling of a 2x2 image but you may ask yourself this is for a 2d transposed convolution but what about 1d well it is pretty simple and similar so to illustrate this we will assume that our input signal has two elements a and b and that we have a filter of length 3 x y and z so we do the uh, multiplication here we get a x a y a z and as you can notice here the stride is 2 in the output signal and this is represented here in this image and uh, once again you can notice that we have an element that will be represented as a summation so it's a z and bx so we will sum these two elements together and that's how we do a 1d transpose convolution but now segnet has one additional detail that is very interesting to mention here it is called a max unpooling it actually starts with the pooling process during the pooling process we usually perform a max operation as the max pooling name suggests and these maximum positions are saved and can be used in the process of max unpooling the concept is uh, fairly simple and we will now demonstrate it in this figure here so the indexes of the maximum positions are shown here on the left let me just show it here on the left and they are highlighted in colors so we have 5, 6, 7 and 8 and then uh, if we have a different matrix elements 1, 2, 3 and 4 we perform max unpooling in a way that we place those elements and the previously remembered maximum locations so as we can see here we have 1, 2, 3 and 4 so the same locations as in the first uh, matrix over here and the rest of the the cells let's call them are getting the values of zero so we essentially did a zero path and this is just illustrated in this right matrix here so if we move on we can see that for every down sampling layer that we have we need to pair it up with an up sampling layer so looking at this figure here we have an, a down sampling layer that is colored in red here and we need to have an up sampling layer over here on the exact position just on the right so we have a blue uh, layer that is the up sampling layer same thing here we have a down sampling layer over here with the red and we also have a up sampling layer over here and that's how segnet essentially works now that we have covered the basics of the segnet model we can move on and see the overview or what the unet model is so it is also known a skip, as a skip connection model we will cover it later why skip connection but looking at the architecture here I will just scroll down to get a better view um, we can see on the left part over here we have an encoder part and on the right part we have a decoder architecture so here we have some pooling layers and convolutions and here we have some unpoolings and uh, convolutions also so looking at the shape of this model uh, we can see where it got its name so unet it's like a letter u here and when this model was first proposed it was created for image segmentation for biomedical images and one interesting thing here is that the gray horizontal connections here or these gray uh, lines and we can also he see here these squares attached to these uh, blue squares over here and they're connecting the encoder and decoder part in the network and these represent the skip connections and we will examine them examine what they are later on so the main idea behind the unit is that the decoder part the right part of the network over here is processing a lot of image data and basically compressing it into a bottleneck layer and these can be viewed as high level information um, essentially in the decoder we are trying to add and recreate more and more detail to get an output segmentation map and as we progress through the encoder part over here on the left part uh, more and more spatial information is lost as we do the convolutions and on the other hand the low level features are essential to determine the exact boundaries of the objects so we don't want to lose that information so the main goal of the skip connections is that they pass these low level informations and combine them with the high level informations in the decoder part so here we can see we are sending the low level informations from the first layer for example 
into this uh, decoder part over here and we're combining combining the low level and the high level informations and uh, in practice this combination of uh, features is a simple concatenation of features so well uh, that's it for today's tutorial we hope that you found uh, this overview useful and that you, know, that you now understand the basics behind these algorithms uh, once again this was just an overview and uh, more details about these algorithms will be covered in the upcoming uh, videos and posts so we will see you soon with some more interesting algorithms.